All right, everything I watched in February. Um, I'll just dive right into this one, because there's a lot of good stuff. I watched a lot of good stuff this month. A lot of new stuff, a lot of Oscar nominees. And as usual, I'll put, a, I'll put a spoiler tag if I mention a spoiler. I'll try and avoid spoilers, but if I do spoil something, I'll put a warning on the screen and you can skip to the next thing. Okay, let's go. Flash Gordon. I haven't seen Flash Gordon since I was a kid, since I was a little kid, and I thought it was the most amazing thing in the world. And um, I got it on Blu-ray, rewatched it as an adult through fresh eyes, and um, it's not the greatest thing ever. But it is great. I mean, um, you know, I love the campiness of it. I love the, the, the production design. It's very colorful and kind of evokes the original Flash Gordon serials. And the Queen soundtrack by Queen is really great, really iconic. And Sam Jones is like, it's not a nuanced performance, but it's, it's perfect for that role in that movie. It's, he's the perfect lead for that movie to be really out there and taking big swings and just le leaning into the cheesiness of it all. I had a great time with it. The Holdovers. Holdovers finally came out in UK cinemas. It's a fucking Christmas movie. It's specifically set at Christmas. And they didn't release it in the UK until, like, the end of January. What's that all about? Unless unless they were waiting for Oscar nominations, which is possible. Um, I thought it was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. I loved uh, Paul Giamatti's fantastic in it and Dominic Sessa. And they have such a great dynamic of, you know, you can kind of see where it's going to go. Because it's not, I don't want to say it's not original. Because I don't think I've ever seen a movie that's specifically like this one. But, you know, you know, at first they're going to hate each other. And they're going to, as they're forced to spend the Christmas break together, they're going to gradually become warm up to each other and become friends. Friends. Um, but the way they played it and the way it was written by, I think, David Hemmingson, I want to say the guy's name is, was really beautiful and really touching um, and really funny. It was such a funny movie. It was Sideways is one of my favorite films. So I, you know, I had very high expectations for the Alexander Payne, Paul Giamatti reunion 20 years later. And it's exactly, it has exactly what I loved about Sideways, where it's a, it works as both a really funny comedy and as a really touching, moving drama. Um, and the switches between those two tones are never jarring because it's all it's all about the characters and it's, and it's and the performances ring true in every single scene. And uh, Divine Joy Randolph or Dave, I think Davine is how you pronounce it. Davine Joy Randolph um, is also incredible as you know she's also in the mix as this grieving mother. You've got these two these two guys bickering over tiny minute insignificant things while she's going through like maybe the most unspeakable tragedy that a, a mother can go through, which is she's lost her son really young and she has to just live with that grief. And she played it so authentically and so beautifully. And so she's my she's my pick for Best Supporting Actress. I really hope she wins that. And even for Paul Giamatti, I, I was all for Killian for Best Actor, but I don't think I would love to see Paul Giamatti win. Griselda. This, I, I enjoyed it, but I found it to be kind of a letdown. It wasn't as great as I think it could have been, um, or as great as this um, this unbelievable true story ha allowed it to be. It's just, it's a lot of cliches of drug dealer movies. We've you, got like the up and comer comes in and talks to the big boss and says something insulting, and everyone in the room's like, oh no, the boss is gonna kill her, and then the boss is like, I like you. You know, that kind of bullshit that you've seen in a million fucking drug movies and TV shows. Uh, however, it was really interesting to see Sophia Vergara in a dramatic role, in a really dark role, because I love her in Modern Family. I'm a huge Modern Family fan. I rewatch it all the time. And um, so it was interesting to see the other side of the coin that she can do. She can do really silly, family friendly comedy, and she can do really dark, grown ups only, violent action stuff. Uma, or Uma, I don't know how you pronounce it. This was, I thought this could do no wrong. You know, it's a horror movie, supernatural horror movie with, with Sandra O, oh and uh, produced by Sam Raimi. So I thought with that talent involved, you know, this should be a fun ride. And uh, I was really, really underwhelmed by it. I didn't find it scary in the slightest. Um, it kind of reminded me of Run Rabbit Run, which I watched a couple months ago, in that it's a horror movie that doesn't deserve its incredible lead actor. With Run Rabbit Run, it was Sarah Snook from Succession, and here it's Sandra Oh, deserving of a much, much better script and a much more well-developed character. Um, I like the idea of it, the concept of it, where um, it kind of like, it's this grand horror movie metaphor for generational trauma, I think. Because um, Sandra oh has a bit of a strained relationship with her daughter, and she had a difficult relationship with her mother. Um, and then her mother's ghost is haunting the house that she lives in with her daughter. So it had all the components to be like a really great ghost story, and a horror commentary on something that affects a lot of people. Um, and like a very human thing. 
But it just didn't do enough with it. It's just a load of cliches you've seen in a million haunted house movies. Um, the jump scares just aren't scary, you know? I mean, there's this one bit where Sandra Oh is getting dragged into the ground, into the dirt. And that's a scary concept. Just drowning in dirt is a terrifying fucking concept and horrible way to go. But the way it's filmed is so silly that it's not, it, it's not scary at all. So that was a huge letdown, Uma or Oma. Dark Waters. This is essentially um, Mark Ruffalo versus Teflon. It's, I didn't really, I'd heard of Teflon before watching the movie. I didn't really know anything about it. Um, Teflon, as I understand it from having seen the movie, is this chemical um, that was getting put onto household items like cooking, cookware. Um, and it was uh, very toxic and dangerous and poisonous and giving people cancer. And, uh, you know, there was like hundreds of cases across the country of this happening. And Mark Ruffalo is like the one, the one guy standing up to the, the uh, Leviathan of DuPont, the chemical company. So it kind of has that uh, Paths of Glory, The Wire kind of thing of uh, an individual standing up to a corrupt, crooked institution and, and, and standing up for what's right against these incredible odds. Um, and a lot of the actual movie is these really drawn out kind of court proceedings and he's filing, Mark Ruffler's filing documents, and he's interviewing people. And that could have been boring. But I know I didn't get bored. It's the kind of thing that would bore me because I'm a child at heart. <laughs> but uh, Mark, I know Mark Ruffalo was fantastic. He kept it compelling. He kept it engaging the whole way. And he's just one guy, one stressed out guy who keeps coming across these huge hurdles and these huge obstacles, not just from DuPont, but like from his own bosses. And uh, he just kept fighting for years and years. And uh, it's kind of an incredible story. A Dark Song. After being disappointed by Uma, I really wanted to see a really great horror film. And I was listening to Pat Oswalt on, uh, I think, Mick Garris' podcast. And at the end, Mick asked him, what, what recent horror films have you seen that you'd recommend? And this was recorded years ago. Um, and, uh, and Patton was raving about this movie, A Dark Song, which I'd never heard of. Um, so I ordered it on DVD and watched it, and uh, he hadn't overpraised it. It's as great as he said it was. It was I thought it was fantastic, kind of a, you know, a character-driven horror film. And just such a great premise where this woman wants to get in touch with her guardian angel. So she hires this guy, this like quirky, eccentric uh, occultist. And she rents a house in the middle of nowhere, and they do this like months long ritual where he draws a line of sand around the house, and he's like, once we begin the ritual, no one can cross that line. And of course, that sets up, that's like a Chekhov's gun. Someone's gonna cross the line, and bad shit's gonna happen. Um, and this was like, if Uma is on the is on the negative side of the scale of like shitty horror movies that aren't scary at all, and don't give the don't give the actors enough stuff to work with with their characters, this is on the complete other end of the spectrum where the actors have a ton to work with and they do a great job with it, and it's scary as fuck. And it's, you know, it's a two-hander. These two people are forced to live together and speak to no one else and never leave the house for months. And they don't like each other. She fucking hates this guy. And he's, he seems like a misanthrope. He seems like he hates everyone. And they have all these disagreements. It's really interesting. I really enjoyed it. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? This is the um, the Mike Nichols movie version of the play. Um, and uh, I, think it was, I think it was Mike Nichols' first ever film he directed. Um, it's a, if that's the case, that's a hell of a debut. Um, I'd seen this movie years and years ago, like on TV, um, but I didn't really remember it, and I've since read the play, which is great. Um, so I wanted to watch the movie again, knowing the characters a bit better from having read the play. And it's just a really, really great story. You know, these, uh, you get these four characters in a room together, and all the secrets start spilling out. It's really great stuff, and really well acted, you know, Liz Taylor. Can I say that? I'm not a Hollywood insider. Elizabeth Taylor, I should say. And uh, Richard Burton, uh, Sandy Dennis, George Siegel. It was really interesting to see George Siegel as the young guy. Because I know him primarily as the granddad in the Goldbergs. <laughs> He's the old guy. So it was interesting to go back to a time when he was cast as the young book. <laughs> um, I thought it was great. I mean, that's not news. It's a classic. But it's, it, it is. It's great. The Last Waltz. I've been getting into the band recently, because I didn't, um, you know, I've always liked The Weight, I thought, I always thought that was a great song. Um, but I haven't really listened to anything else they've done. And then, I've always loved uh, Robbie Robertson's scores he's done for, for Martin Scorsese's films, the last few films. Um, the late, great Robbie Robertson passed away recently. Um, but I didn't realize he was in the band. So I've been listening to a lot of the band, and um, loving a lot of their songs, Ophelia, and uh, The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down. Then I find out the band have a movie, like one of the most renowned concert movies ever filmed, and it was directed by Scorsese. So I watched that and I loved it, you know, there's a lot of great concert footage, um, where you see them play the hits, and the crowd's going wild, and you see them kind of shake up a bit how it's how it is on the record versus how they're playing it on stage. And then interspersed with all that is documentary footage, um, you know, backstage, and interviews with them. Um, 
I just found the whole thing really fascinating. I loved it. The Beaver. This was a this was a weird movie. Um, I guess kind of a character study. Um, but a character study of the whole family. Um, the whole premise is that Mel Gibson is um, not a very good husband and father, and he's an alcoholic. So there was clearly some method acting going on there. I think this movie came out like right after his public alcoholism scandals, uh, if that's what you want to call them. Um, so I think at the time, it was a bit too close to the vest for some critics. They were a bit uncomfortable with it. Um, but it's a really interesting performance. He tries, he, he sort of like, he's kicked out of his house by his wife, played by Jodie Foster, who I think also directed the movie. And she's great, as usual. Um, and then sort of a couple of days later, he tries to move back in. And he's like speaking to his family via a beaver puppet on his arm. And at first that was really interesting, um, but it got old pretty quickly and it wasn't really going anywhere in terms of his character development. But what's really interesting about the movie is uh, Mel Gibson and Jodie Foster's son, played by Anton Yelchin, another, you know, late great Anton Yelchin, uh, who unfortunately has passed away. Um, and like a very early career, Jennifer Lawrence, he sort of sparks up a romance with her at his school. She's like the popular girl who wants him to help write her valedictorian speech. Whatever the hell a valedictorian is, I don't know, I've seen it in American TV shows and films. And um, that became the much more interesting component of the film, not the beaver puppet on Mel Gibson's arm. You know, it was their love story was really interesting, um, and their chemistry was really great between the two actors. American Fiction. This, I thought, was absolutely fantastic. I mean, it seemed really interesting from the premise. I loved the premise of it, that he's um, this kind of struggling black author whose publishers want him to write stories that are quote-unquote, more black, and so he sarcastically writes a novel full of the most offensive, obvious stereotypes you can think of, um, in the hope that it'll open their eyes and make them realize how ridiculous they're being by asking them to write more black. But they love it, and they want to publish it, and they want to make it into a movie, and it becomes this huge success. So I thought that was a great premise, um, but I didn't expect to love the movie as much as I did. I mean, um, I mean, it was really great. It was really a great comedy movie-going experience where uh, there wasn't like a huge crowd there. It was like a Saturday afternoon. But let's say there was ten other people there with me, um, and it was great to just everyone's laughing along. It was so funny, and uh, everyone everyone got it, and uh, it was just fantastic. You know, Jeffrey Wright is phenomenal. As, I mean, as always, but I don't think I've ever seen him take center stage like this and be the lead like this. But he was fantastic, and Sterling K. Brown as uh, his brother was great, and Tracy Ellis Ross as, her, as his sister. Um, Leslie Uggams as his, as his mom, who has Alzheimer's, uh, which is just heartbreaking, and she plays that with uh, so much truth. Um, and John Ortiz was really, really funny as, uh, as, as Jeffrey Wright's agent. He was hilarious in it. And Issa Rae, uh, aka President Barbie. She was great as sort of like Jeffrey Wright's arch nemesis, who's, um, she's also gotten really famous and successful with books that, that play on black stereotypes. Um, and then as he gets to know her a bit more, you kind of see uh, her side of it, that she's not just exploiting stereotypes. She, from her own perspective, she is telling the truth and she is, uh, you know, and it gives you the perspective that there is no, uh, Jeffrey Wright has this preconceived notion that there is a right way and a wrong way to tell black stories and express the black experience in stories. And she gives him the perspective that there is no right way or wrong way and you shouldn't try to police how people how artists express themselves and it's just i thought it was amazing i've heard i've listened to the uh claude jefferson the writer director in a few interviews and uh, i think that guy's a genius just the way he talks about his process and how he arrived at all these different ideas for the adaptation um he's a genius i can't wait to see what he does next I, and I loved his ability to um, to tell such a deeply impactful and deeply moving story with so much humor and with so many laughs and making so many great points about society and about race, but in a way that isn't like preachy or on the nose, in a way that feels organic to the characters who are also grappling with these issues. I thought it was amazing. I can completely see why it's gotten so many, you know, Oscar nominations. Argyle. Now this one wasn't as great as American Fiction. But I don't think it was as bad as the reviews have made out. The reviews make it sound like it's the worst movie ever made. Um, but it's, you know, it's a fun action comedy. There's a lot of fun to be had with it. Um, I thought Bryce Dallas Howard and Sam Rockwell were a really great pairing, and they, you know, um, had great chemistry, and they were really funny together and really engaging together and had a lot of kind of charming back and forth. Um, people have complained, like, you know, are the trailers of Overblown, Henry Cavill's role and Dua Lipa's role, and... Uh, most of the actors that are in the trailer basically have cameos. But I never got the sense from the trailers that Henry Cavill or Dua Lipa were supposed to be the leads. I mean, they're the ones front and center on the fucking poster, but every single scene they're in in the trailer is the same scene. So it was pretty obvious they were only going to really be in one scene. It was obvious to me from the trailer that Bryce Dallas Howard and Sam Rockwell were the leads. And I loved it that way. I, I thought they were fantastic. There's some really stupid stuff in it. You know, there's like, there's there's way too many twists. You know, it's, uh, there's so many twists 
that you forget what you were even supposed to think at the beginning that they've now upended about eight times with twists. And there's a whole thing where the Beatles song Now and Then, which came out about a year ago, if that, is supposed to be like the song that has defined Bryce Dallas Howard's entire life. And, you know, there was a, there's a coma in her backstory and she's written like six Argyle books. So we're talking like a good, at least a decade, maybe longer. So how is this set in the future? How are we supposed to believe that a song that just came out has been a part of her life forever? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And it's too long. It's like two hours, 20 minutes. I think this would have been a great two hour movie. Um, and some of the action scenes get a bit too ridiculous where they're like, what the fuck are they doing? So it's not, I'm not necessarily here to defend Argyle, but it doesn't deserve, you know, the one star reviews it's been getting and the worst movie ever made label it's been given. I think people who are calling Argyle the worst movie ever made haven't seen enough movies. You know, if you only ever watch like the top 10 highest grossing films of the year, they're probably all gonna be pretty good. And so maybe a film like Argyle seems worse than it actually is. But, um, you know, it wasn't as great as the first Kingsman. I think it was a cut above The King's Man, which I thought was dog shit. And it's maybe on par with uh, Kingsman 2, where it's not that great, but it's also, you know, pretty fun, pretty watchable. But I'm a cheerleader. I only just found out this movie existed a couple of weeks ago. I sort of stumbled upon it. I think I saw an article that said something like, Bottoms can't top, but I'm a cheerleader as the, as the greatest queer comedy. And um, having now seen But I'm a Cheerleader, I disagree with that headline. I think Bottoms is a better movie. Um, but I did really enjoy uh, But I'm a Cheerleader. It's from like the 90s. Um, and it's about uh, Natasha Lyonne stars as like a, uh, she's like, seems to be the typical American high school girl. She's, you know, um, she's a cheerleader and she's got a boyfriend who's a jock or whatever. And, um, but she kind of, she realizes she's gay. And um, when she tells her parents, they send her to like a conversion therapy place. And there, even though the therapy is all around suppressing her sexual desires, she meets the others and gets along with them and she learns to embrace her sexuality. And, um, I didn't think the movie had quite as much satirical bite as it was made out to have, but even just that a movie with that premise um, and that message of gay rights got made in the 90s is pretty impressive. It was a great cast, obviously Natasha Lyonne is great, and Clea Duvall played her love interest, and um, Kathy Moriarty from Raging Bull, she sort of plays like the, the leader of the camp, and, um, and RuPaul was in it, and uh, Bud Court was in it, Melanie Linsky, there's a ton of great actors, it was sort of like a who's who, even Michelle Williams has a small role in it. So I still prefer Bottoms, um, I didn't love Bottom I'm a Cheerleader that much, um, but it was pretty great, and I can see why it's uh, a cult classic. Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. I've been sort of in the early stages of writing a book about the worst movies ever made. So naturally I started with Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. You often see that on lists of like the worst movies ever made for obvious reasons. And it's kind of like, it does what it says on the tin. You know, you're not going to get Citizen Kane with a movie called Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. You're going to get Santa Claus on Mars where they're trying to bring Christmas cheer to the Martian children and he's got to get back to Earth. It's... It, you know, it's as ridiculous as it sounds, and it's a really low-budget, cheap production. But that's kind of the charm of it, you know? I think if Hollywood made a $100 million version of Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, it wouldn't have the soul um, or, like, the homemade charm that this crappy little cheap version from, like, the 50s has. Uh, or it might have been 60s, I'm not too sure. I can't think of it, it probably is more 60s. Curb Your Enthusiasm. I've said before, Curb is my, my favorite TV show ever. And it's in its final season. It's in its 12th and final season. And I've been uh, writing articles about it every week. So I'm watching it every week. Um, I did not get press screeners for this one. I was supposed to. Um, you know, my bosses reached out to HBO to get me some press screeners. And um, and they sent some to the, the editor I've been working with on these articles. Because she was doing like a, a review of them. Um, they didn't send them to me. They've been stingy. Stingier than FX and Peacock have been previously. But I don't mind watching it on TV like a com like a commoner. Um, I think it's been great. I've been loving this season so far. I'm not quite sure how they're, what they're building up to with the ending. There seems to be there seems to be maybe repeating the Seinfeld ending with Larry going to court and every all the all his enemies from the show come in as character witnesses. Um, but I feel like the way the way Curb usually is done, they're probably Larry probably wants us to think that's where it's going. And then it will go off in a completely different direction and do something completely unexpected. So I just, I can't wait to see how it all wraps up. Um, 
But even, you know, the ongoing serialized elements notwithstanding, there's been some great standalone episodes as well. Like the whole thing um, with the lawn jockey and the whole thing with uh, where Larry hit Troy Kotsur with a golf ball because he couldn't yell four because he's deaf. That was all classic Curb. Um, and then while I've been watching the new season every week, I've been going back and re-watching the older seasons. And it's just the best. It just, it never gets old. And I love the, um, the whole premise of you just send this, this Larry David character crashing into a civilized social situation and challenging all the unwritten rules of society. It's just like, it's comedy in the purest form. Badland Hunters. This is a really cool movie that popped up on Netflix. Kind of like a, you know, it's a, it's a Korean movie. It's like a, it's like a dystopian, post-apocalyptic action movie. Um, it's got that guy from Eternals and, uh, and, uh, Train to Busan. Um, Don Lee. He's great in it. He's like a, you know, like a typical post-apocalyptic badass, you know, Joel Miller or Mad Max type character. And he's really great in that role. And it, uh, you know, it doesn't reinvent the wheel. It has a lot of the cliches of the civilization has collapsed, you know, where you've got these different factions and some of them are evil and the sort of anti-hero has to protect the good, the good community from the bad community. But, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I'll watch the Yojimbo story, the, uh, the, the Fistful of Dollars story, in a post-apocalyptic setting as many times as filmmakers are willing to make it. The Lost Daughter. This was really, really moving, really well-made movie. It was uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal's directorial debut. And it kind of, it got a few Oscar nominations a couple of years ago, but I had, it had completely flown under my radar. I stumbled across it one day on Netflix. I ended up being really affected by it. I thought it would be something that would just sort of stick on in the background for a couple of hours. But um, the performances are absolutely fantastic. It's uh, Olivia Colman is the star and she's on holiday on her own. And it's one of those movies that they don't really make it like this anymore. They're sort of like how they used to make movies in like the 70s, where the first sort of like 10 or 15 minutes, um, no one speaks really. You just see Olivia Coleman arrive at her apartment that she's staying in while she's on holiday, and she goes down to the beach, and she's reading her book by the sea, and she's she's sort of like watching this young woman and her daughter, the, the, the woman played by uh, Dakota Johnson, um, and she sort of like becomes attached to them, and then via flashbacks, you start to realize, uh, you know, uh, Jesse Buckley plays the younger version of Olivia Coleman, raising her kids, and you see that, you know, she wasn't that great of a mom. She was, um, you know, not like full-blown abusive, but like had a really bad temper and didn't have the patience to deal with small children. And you can kind of tell she's filled with regret about that, and she kind of sees, in Dakota Johnson, she sees her younger self. And it just kind of unfolds like that. It's a very character-driven story. Um, I thought it was fantastic, and I thought Maggie Gyllenhaal did a fantastic job directing it. And I think also she wrote it. I think it was based on a novel, but she wrote the script. So she's one to, you know, I'll be keeping an eye out what her next movie's gonna be. Grounded 2, Making The Last of Us Part 2. I, um, for anyone who's who's watching the TV show and hasn't played the games, I won't spoil what happens in, in The Last of Us 2, but, uh, I'd seen a lot of people on Reddit talking about, you know, this making of documentary about The Last of Us 2, and I thought, um, that it was on some streaming service or something, or it came with the remastered version of the game. But one day I just stumbled across it on YouTube. The whole feature-length thing is just on YouTube to be watched. And, um, I thought it was incredible. I mean, I think Last of Us 2 is one of the greatest video games ever made. Um, from, not just from a story perspective, even though the storytelling is, is magnificent and unlike anything I've ever seen, um, from a gameplay perspective as well. And it was, I've never seen behind the scenes of a video game before, so it was really interesting to see, like, what it looks like when they're starting out and the environments are, like, in their earliest forms and it all looks really shitty because they haven't added all the detail to it yet and they're just sort of figuring out the mechanics of it. It kind of puts in perspective just how fucking much work it takes to make a video game, to create these worlds that you can just explore from scratch. Um, and it was amazing to watch the actors, to watch, like, Troy Baker and Ashley Johnson and, and Laura Bailey um, do these scenes I've seen a million times in the game, but do them in the in the in the mocap suits on a sound stage. And even though they look ridiculous, they're wearing like spandex, like what looks like a wetsuit, and they're covered in like ping pong balls for like reference points. Um, it still got to me, like watching the most powerful scenes from the game, watching Ashley Johnson play Ellie was moving and made me cry my eyes out just watching it in the in the mocap form, just on the soundstage. And it also was really heartbreaking and I really cried a lot when, when Laura Bailey is talking about what it was like uh, when the game came out. And there was, you know, I think the majority of the people who played The Last of Us 2 love Abby. Or maybe don't love her at first, because but later on, through being in her shoes and playing her in the game, you come to empathize with her, and she, as far as I'm concerned, she's as much of a beloved character to me as Joel and Ellie are. And I think a lot of other people who played the game feel that way, but then there's a very vocal minority that, it's so insane, they hated this fictional character, and so they targeted all this hatred and death threats and things 
to the actor who played her and were making threatening references to her son who was like a newborn baby at the time. And it's easy from the outside to just be like, well, those people are fucking idiots, fuck them. But to see her talk about what it was like to be on the receiving end of it, it just seemed so fucking horrible. So that was just heartbreaking to watch. I mean, I, I thought, you know, it'd be an interesting peek behind the curtain of one of my favorite games, but it ended up being one of the most moving, tear-jerking fucking movies I watched this month. Blue Jay. This one made me cry my eyes out too. This was, uh, I talked about Paddleton last month, another Mark Duplass movie. And I'm quickly finding that Mark Duplass is one of my favorite fucking actors. Because he can play, it's amazing to me that he can play, um, one of the scariest serial killers, sociopathic serial killers you've seen in a movie ever, in the Creep films. And then play, also play someone who is very, uh, what's the opposite of sociopathic? Someone who has emotions, and someone who is very human. Where in Paddleton, he's a guy who's dying, uh, and in Blue Jay, he's a guy who bumps into his high school sweetheart in the shop, and she's played by Sarah Paulson, who's also fantastic in it. And they just start, like, talking, and sort of, you just follow them throughout this night as they're, uh, talking about old times. And she's married now, um... And he clearly is still in love with her, and she clearly still has feelings for him, and as the night goes on, and they're, like, listening to recordings of themselves from when they were kids, um, and then you find out, like, that there's a dark side, there's a hidden dark side, and why they got, why they broke up, um, it was just beautiful, it was like, for the first hour, it's just, like, this really sort of cute, nostalgic, you know, high school sweethearts catch you up and talk about old times, and then the final 20 minutes, it, like, punches you in the gut with, like, just heartbreaking tragedy. I thought it was amazing. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna look up everything Mark Duplass has ever done, and I'm gonna fucking watch every single one, because he has really impressed me. 99 Homes. This was a really great movie. I mean, it came out, I think, about 10 years ago, um, and I even remember reading back then, when it was coming out, that it should be an Oscar contender, and then I don't think it was. I don't think it got any nominations. But it should have done, because um, cause it's a really powerful, you know, it's a story about the um, the housing market crash and the recession. And But where something like The Big Short is about the recession on a macro scale, uh, from like the perspective of the banks that fucked it all up. Um, 99 Homes, is it's from the perspective of one guy who's kicked out of his house. It's played by Andrew Garfield, who's amazing in this. I mean, he's amazing in everything, but he, this was one of my favorite performances I've seen from him. Um, and Laura Dern is his mom, and he's a, you know, a single dad, he's living with his son, his mom, and, and, and in the family home they've had for generations. And then one day, just Michael Shannon knocks on the door. And Michael Shannon was incredible, too, as the villain. He's like the guy who goes around kicking people out of the houses. And at first he seems like he doesn't give a fuck. Um, but then you later find out that that's not what he wants to do. What he wants to do is put people in new homes. He doesn't want to kick people out of their homes. But that's just where the money is, and that's what he's got settled into. And he's just gotten desensitized to it. Um, so Andrew Garfield and his family they're kicked out and they're living in a motel and when he goes to give Michael Shannon a piece of his mind Michael Shannon ends up hiring him to help him kick people out of their homes and so it was like su such an interesting dynamic and such an interesting story that he's so desperate for money after being kicked out of his house that he will take a job kicking other people out of their houses this situation he was just in yesterday he's gonna put on to other people and it was just this interesting study of how money controls everything like obviously it would be nice if Andrew Garfield could not kick people out of their homes but if he needs the money that badly to support his family and that's the only thing Thing that's paying him right now, then he's gonna have to do it. And then they develop this very begrudging friendship, Andrew Garfield and Michael Shannon. So that's what I find with a lot of these movies about an issue or about uh, a big, you know, a political or economic event like the recession. It just becomes about the issue and everything the characters do and everything that happens to them is about exploring the issue. Whereas this one, the issue is in the backdrop and it is very much what the movie's about. It's a great story, you know? It's just a great story that Andrew Garfield gets kicked out of his house and then he ends up working for Michael Shannon, the guy who kicked him out of his house, to kick all the people out of their houses. That's a hell of a story and a very interesting kind of morality tale. I thought it was beautifully done, and their performances were fucking phenomenal. True Romance. They played this at the, uh, my local cinema around Valentine's Day, and um, I would like to say I took a date, but I went with my dad and my sister. <laughs> Um, but it's such a great film. This is this is another one, one of my favorites, and uh, I forgot how fucking funny it was. Like, it's very moving as a love story, and and it's you know the whole thing that like the cold girl meets this like lonely comic book nerd and falls in love with him, and they get married and they have happily ever after. That's very much like a wish fulfillment fantasy. 
and it works as such. I mean, what what, what are the movies for? It's for escapism. And um, but as much as the premise is this wish fulfillment fantasy, the Christian Slater and Patricia Arquette have such incredible chemistry that you you still buy it. You still buy that they love each other. And then, as the gangsters come after them and bad things start happening to them, um, you really feel for them and you really root for them. And there's so many great kind of supporting players in it. You've got like Christopher Walken and Dennis Hopper have that amazing Sicilian scene. That's like one of the greatest dialogue scenes ever written. Um, James Gandolfini as a ruthless fucking mobster, you know, years before he would play Tony Soprano. Um, Brad Pitt as a stoner who never gets off the couch. He's hilarious. That was, I mean, the whole movie's really funny. I forgot how many laughs there were. And it was great to watch it. It was like a big crowd because it's such a beloved movie. And I mean, there was so many laughs throughout the film, but every time Brad Pitt was on screen, it was like a huge laugh. It was so great. Eyes wide shut. I'd never seen this all the way through, but I'm, I'm toying with the idea of maybe doing a, um, a Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick ranking video of all his films. Um, and this was his final film before his death. I think it actually came out after his death. And, uh... There's a lot of discussion of whether or not it's really his final cut because he would famously tinker with his films right up to the release date. And sometimes after the release date, he would still change things and send out a new print to the cinemas. So it's possible that he wasn't completely done with Eyes Wide Shut, but it doesn't play like a rough cut. I mean, it play, it's long, but it plays like a final cut. And it was very, very well made. And uh, it was really interesting to see Tom Cruise, you know, in a darker role. I always love that kind of thing. Like him in Magnolia is really interesting to watch. Or Tropic Thunder. <laughs> Just any time where Tom Cruise isn't Tom Cruise, he plays like um, a really interesting, complex, dark figure, and that was that was kind of what this was. That he descends into this this secret underground sex world, and Nicole Kidman was great too as his wife, and I think they were married in real life at the time, so that adds you know another layer of on-screen chemistry. Um, I didn't love Eyes Wide Shut as much as some of Kubrick's other films. I see some people say that they think Eyes Wide Shut is his best film. But no way is this on the level of 2001 or Doctor Strangelove or, or The Shining um, or even like Full Metal Jacket. Um, but you know, that's what's going to be tough about ranking Kubrick's movies if I do this video because he never made a bad one. He never made a really bad movie. This is a really good movie and I'm saying it's one of his worst. But it's, you know, maybe it's like the issue I had with society a couple months ago. It's uh, the depravity of it was oversold to me. You know, it's like a two and a half hour movie, maybe even pushing three hours. And uh, the secret billionaire orgy cult is confined to like a 15 minute scene in the middle. And then the rest of the film is just a more or less standard drama. But it was, you know, again, it wasn't a bad movie. It was a really, really well made, really great movie. Just not as great as a lot of Kubrick's other films. Ghostbusters Afterlife. I hadn't seen this since it was in cinemas, and um, when I was making the Lost Reviews video, um, it reminded me how much I loved it, and uh, and the new one, Frozen Empire, is coming out in a few weeks, so uh, thought it'd be a good idea to rewatch this one, refresh myself on these new characters. And I still feel exactly the same way I did in, in the review I wrote three years ago, or four, however many years ago it was. Um, that it's, you know, the best Ghostbusters sequel since the first one, and it's uh, the way it honors Harold Ramis' legacy is really beautiful, and I mean, that made me cry my eyes out in the, in the cinema, not expecting it. Because Harold Ramis, when I was growing up, Harold Ramis was like a hero of mine. The fact that his job was to write movies like Ghostbusters and Animal House was amazing to me, and I wanted to be Harold Ramis. And so when he died, it made me very sad, and seeing him brought back to life in ghost form, to sort of like pass the torch to his on-screen granddaughter in Ghostbusters Afterlife was really beautiful. And I wasn't expecting it at all. And it, uh, you know, it felt right. It felt fitting. It wasn't like when they brought, you know, Christopher Reeve back from the grave for a cheap cameo in The Flash. This one felt like it had real love and that the movie was, it, it says at the end, for Harold. But this really was for Harold. And, it, and I wasn't the only one who was moved, because I remember looking around the cinema afterwards as I was getting up to leave, and all the women in the room were crying. None of the men were. I don't know what that says about me or about society or how men express their emotions. But uh, I know I wasn't the only one who was touched by the Harold Ramis tribute. The Zone of Interest. This is, I can see why this has been so successful and getting so many Oscar nominations, because this is one of the most powerful Holocaust films ever made. It almost feels like, um, like an obligation. If there's a Holocaust movie, it has to be nominated for Best Picture. But uh, this is one that will not be forgotten about soon. This is one that I think will stand beside Schindler's List and Son of Saul with the very best Holocaust movies ever made. Because most Holocaust films are about, are from the perspective of the prisoners in the camps. And there's only so many ways to say that it was horrible to be a prisoner in a concentration camp and that what was done to them was horrific um, and barbaric and inhuman because that's been done in a million movies now. Um, 
But what Jonathan Glazer does in the zone of interest is show it from the German's perspective and have Auschwitz in the background. It's got, you know, it's Rudolf Hess and his family trying to build this idyllic life in their new home that is right on the other side of a wall from Auschwitz. And they're in the garden having like a tea party and the kids are playing stick and hoop or whatever the fuck. And you can hear gunshots and Nazis barking orders and, and people screaming in terror. And um, at night, all you can see out the window is the is huge plumes of fire and smoke coming out of the chimneys from the gas chambers. And it's so fucking unsettling. Um, and made more unsettling by the fact that it's to the Hess family, it's totally normal. Or Hoss. I don't, I'm not sure I pronounced it. I think it's Hess. Or is Hess a different guy? I don't know. And I remember sitting in the cinema watching it and kind of like checking the time, being like, when's this going to be over? When can I leave? And at the time, I thought, I can't have been that great of a movie because I was checking my watch and seeing when I could leave. But it was p precisely because the movie was so great and so well done. Because it was making me so fucking uncomfortable. I just wanted that experience to end. And that's the real magic trick of it. To make you that uncomfortable that you don't even want to be watching the movie. I thought it was just a really, really incredible achievement. Um, and like, the score was really unsettling and, and um, the performances, the sort of banality of the performances where from their perspective, the, the genocide next door is normal and it's dad's job. I just, uh, kind of mind blowing. Friday night dinner. After I got home from the zone of interest and I was feeling deeply uncomfortable, I wanted to just watch something funny and lighthearted. And uh, only just now I'm making the connection that there it's about a Jewish family and, and I just watched a movie about Auschwitz and then I go home and start watching a sitcom about a Jewish family. But um, Netflix was advertising, you know, we've got the final seasons coming to Netflix. And uh, I actually hadn't seen the show since the last season was on TV a few years ago because um, I remember thinking it was awful. And it kind of just put me off the whole show. But then... I went back to the start and rewatched it, and it kind of reminded me how fucking great it was in the early days. And then when I got to the final season, it's like there's really only one episode that was really bad, and the rest are all pretty good. Um, it was the one where Adam and Johnny's au pair comes to visit, and Jim falls in love with her. That was painfully unfunny. Um, but every other episode of the show is at least pretty good, and at the best, really, really great. I mean, any episode with Mr. Morris is fucking hilarious. He's one of the funniest characters, I think, in TV history. And, um, and the one where, you know, Adam is staying at the house and he's wearing his pajamas and then Johnny accidentally rips the bottoms off and drops them in a puddle. And then there's the one where Martin drops an oil can on the carpet and he has to try and get the carpet cleaner in without Jackie knowing. And he has to just keep making up lie after lie. And it starts getting more and more ridiculous where he has to, like, talk her into going to a restaurant while she's cooking a meal. And he has to explain why the car is missing when they come out of the restaurant. It was just, uh... It's a really funny show, and like all the best sort of like family sitcoms, you know, you can recognize your own family and their relationships. You might not, maybe not the specifics are the same, but like everyone can see parts of their own mom in Jackie, and everyone can see parts of their own dad in Martin. And that's just uh, Paul Ritter, as the late, another fucking one we've lost, the late great Paul Ritter as Martin is just a spectacular performance, a hilarious character, just one of the funniest like TV dads of all fucking time. Tombstone. I've written a ton of articles about Tombstone, because for some fucking reason, Tombstone gets a ton of clicks. You write anything about Tombstone, particularly Val Kilmer as Doc Holliday, you'll get a ton of clicks. It gets a ton of engagement. I don't know why, you know, um... Tombstone, based on the clicks, Tombstone is as popular as Marvel or Star Wars or any of these things. Um, and I don't understand. It's a fucking western from 30 years ago. But for some reason, it's like the most popular movie in the world today. Like, I wrote an article about why Val Kilmer sweats through the whole movie because Doc Holliday had tuberculosis. Or why, what the line, I'm your huckleberry means, which I think is an old-timey expression. Um, so I've written all these articles about Tombstone. I'd never even seen it. and it, But I noticed it was on Disney+, Plus, so I watched it. And it is kind of fucking amazing. It's, um... It's, uh, you know, the way it's made, it's like, it's like an old western. It's like the same way that the holdovers, um, looks and feels like a movie that could have been made in the 70s. Tombstone feels like a western that could have been made in the 50s. Um, that was really great, like, the way the actors played it and the way they carry themselves and the way, uh, the sets are designed and the way the, the way the action is shot and the way it's edited together. Um, you know, it didn't have the feel of, like, a modern, postmodern 90s western. It had the feel of just a classic old Hollywood western. And I fucking loved it. 2001 A Space Odyssey. I watched this because I was doing a, a dummy's guide to 2001 A Space Odyssey. Which uh, is a video I'm really proud of. I think that's one of my best efforts. Um, and this is a movie that I discovered as a little kid. I just stumbled upon it. I like, f found it on some dodgy website when I was a kid. And... Um, like, stayed up all night watching it, and I was just blown away by it, by, uh, the way a movie can, a movie from that long ago as well, can really transport you into space and into these, into this incredible, breathtaking vision of the future and of what contact with alien life might 
look like and uh, what the next stage of human evolution might look like and these, these incredible ideas that kind of went over my head when I was a kid watching it when I was like 10. Um, but just the visuals are alone are enough to carry you even if you have no idea what's going on. And then as I got older I watched it over and over and over again. Um, I hadn't seen it in a while. I, I'd, uh, and then with a movie like that you watch it so many times you get to a certain point where you think okay I know this frame by frame I don't need to watch it anymore. Um, but then I had the idea to do this video and I got it on 4k. And it blew my mind again. It was like I was watching it through fresh eyes. Even though I recognized everything, I knew exactly where it was going. It just kind of has that magical thing about it where you can't even quite put your finger on what makes it such an incredible experience to watch it. Other than it, it's it's pure cinema. It's like everything that cinema can do is in that movie. I think if I do do this Kubrick ranking video, 2001 will be pretty high. It will probably take the top spot. Grounded, Making The Last of Us. After I watched uh, The Making of The Last of Us 2, it popped up as a recommendation, hey, watch Making The Last of Us 1. Um, which, the fact that the, the other one was called Grounded 2 would insinuate that it's a sequel. But I didn't know they'd done one for The Last of Us 1 as well, so that was that was another one that was amazing to watch. It would see, um, you know, with this one, you get to see the casting process, and you get to see how Neil Druckmann came up with the story of Joel and Ellie, and how originally there was a lot more going on in the story, but what they felt the most compelled by was this relationship between Joel and Ellie, so they just focused the story on that and created, again, one of the greatest video games of all time. And um, it's amazing to see the casting process and you see how they how they landed on Troy Baker for Joel and then how they landed on Ashley Johnson for Ellie and how when they were casting Ellie and having people come in and read with Troy Baker. Um, when Ashley Johnson came in, it just immediately felt right. And that seems to be always the way it goes. It's Like that, I think, was the way it was when they cast Cheryl Hines to play Larry David's wife in Cobra Enthusiasm. That she just came in and was this perfect counterbalance to what Larry was bringing to the table. Sounds like the same thing happened with casting Troy Baker and Ashley Johnson. And again, it was just amazing to see, you know, we see the finished product, we see the completed thing um, when it's perfect. But for a long time, it's not perfect as they're trying to figure out the story beats. And then they have to design all the environments. They have to figure out what the gameplay is going to be. They have to figure out what's Ellie going to do. Because she's, she's an NPC, technically, but she's the heart of the game. And how they went from, at first she wasn't doing anything, um, to she can help out. Like she can, if you're getting, if you've got three bad guys coming after you, she can pick up a bottle and throw it at one of the guys and help you out. And how that made it this much more engaging experience and also made you connect with Ellie more. It was just, uh, just really fascinating to see how it all came together. Because I don't know the first thing about how video games get made. Ted. I watched the, the Ted series a few times from my press screeners that the Peacock were nice enough to give me, unlike the arseholes at HBO. Um, and then when it came on Now TV, because it came out, I got the press screeners uh, a couple of weeks before the US release, but the UK release was like a month later. So when it did come on, when it popped up on Now TV in the UK, I just watched it again. And um, it's still hilarious. I really hope, I really hope there's a season two. The viewing figures have been crazy for, for Peacock standards. I mean, even by Netflix or Amazon Prime standards, it would probably be a huge hit, but especially of Peacock, which doesn't have a single fucking hit in its roster, they should be jumping at the chance to renew it for season two. City of the Living Dead. This is the, the Fulci movie I wanted to get a couple of months ago. I got City of the Dead by accident with Christopher Lee. Um, so I got the right one. I got City of the Living Dead and watched that. And, um, you know, it's a perfectly serviceable zombie movie. It doesn't quite have... You know, there are some Lucio Fulci movies where they have these moments that stick with you. Like, there's a scene in, I think it's called The Beyond, the one with the, uh, the hotel in New Orleans that's built on a, the gates to hell. There's a bit in that where a guy, like, falls off a ladder and, like, hurts his back and he can't move. And all these fucking tarantulas come out and start chewing his face. Off. That was absolutely disgusting and unsettling, and I fucking hate spiders. But that was great, that stuck with me, I never forgot it. And then in uh, Zombie Flesh Eaters, there's the scene where the zombie pulls the woman's head, pulls her eyeball first into a big splinter of wood and pokes her eye out. And I never forgot that either. Sick of the Living Dead didn't really have anything like that. It didn't really have anything that, like, that I couldn't get out of my brain. Um, it was just like a perfectly fine zombie movie. And I actually preferred City of the Dead, so we'll call that one... I think I already called it a happy accident because I liked it, but I liked it more than City of the Living Dead, so it was an even happier accident. The Green Knight. I really wanted to like this because I love weird movies, and I love when... Like, a reasonably large amount of money gets pumped into a weird movie, and they can bring these crazy visuals to life, like, um, like giants wandering the foggy hills, or a uh, tree monster gets decapitated, or, you know, these crazy things. But I just kind of felt bored most of the time. I didn't find it to be all, uh, I didn't find it to be all that great. Very disappointing. 
Anatomy of a Fall. This was fucking great. I, this was, I think, the last Best Picture nominee I had to watch. Um, and I thought it was amazing. You know, it's this kind of murder mystery, but 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 more of an examination of a marriage where this woman's husband falls out of a third story window and he's got an injury on his head. And then the, the autopsy determines that he had the injury on his head before he fell from the window. And so they think his wife killed him. And then she's put on trial and she has to try and prove her innocence. Um, and she's played by Sandra Huller, or Hula. I think it's Huller. It's got the two dots over the U. Um, she was also in Zone of Interest. She was Rudolph Hess's wife in Zone of Interest, and she was fantastic in that, and she was fucking fantastic in this. Um, and even down to, like, the little kid who plays her son was amazing in it, and even the dog was a great fucking actor in this. That was a great performance. From the dog! And it's, you know, uh, Justine Triette, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, she's French, uh, director, she she could have gone down the procedural route. She could have just made this, you know, um, a regular courtroom drama. But instead, she uses it to examine the characters, and she and you know she wheels out all this evidence where the husband had been recording some of his conversations with his wife, and you hear these really intense arguments and things are getting broken, things are thrown around the room that make it sound like they had a very tough marriage and a very violent marriage, which doesn't help her case at all. And it's interesting that she's within the French legal system, and she's German, and so her English and her French aren't that good. So she's as she's trying to express herself and trying to describe what her relationship with her husband was like and why she didn't kill him. Him. She's kind of struggling to string a sentence together and to express herself because she can't speak in her own native tongue. And that added a whole extra interesting element to it. I thought it was uh, really spectacular, really... Um, you know, a lot of times I find these, you know, investigation type movies um, to be really boring as they just go along with the formula. But this this one isn't formulaic in the slightest. It kind of um, it kind of flies in the face of what the formula dictates at every turn. And I love the way... I'll, I'll put a spoiler tag on, but I'll try not to spoil it. But the ending uh, is ambiguous. It doesn't really provide you with a clear answer one way or the other, but it gives you enough information to kind of try and figure it out for yourself. And normally that kind of ending I would hate if I'm going to sit through two and a half hours of a movie about whether or not uh, a woman killed her husband. I want to fucking know definitively, did she kill him or not? But this was kind of the um, exception where that was the best ending for the movie because I was left thinking about it for days, like trying to piece it together of like what could have happened? Did she do it? Did she not do it? And you know, Justine Triette, again, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, she um, leaves you to decide for yourself and everyone will have a different answer. And that's great. It's not in, you know, not in a cop-out way, in like a really brilliant artistic kind of way. Nathan For You, Finding Francis. I've been watching Nathan For You over and over since I discovered it. I only discovered it recently because I'd loved Nathan Fielder in The Curse and I hadn't seen anything else he did. But I've been watching every episode of Nathan For You probably about 10 times. But Finding Francis, the final episode that is feature length and easily the most somber in tone and kind of a drastic departure from what the rest of the series was. Um, it's the one I keep coming back to the most and I've been I watched it again because I'm, I'm I want to make a video about it because I I'm so moved by it and I find it to be such a beautiful love story and such an unconventionally told love story where Nathan tries to reunite this old man this lonely old man full of regret with uh, that with the high school sweetheart he left behind like 60 years ago and it's I'm about to do a video on it so I won't talk too much about my thoughts on it here but it's incredible I think it's a really incredible story the iron claw I thought this was fucking fantastic too I um I have absolutely no interest in wrestling whatsoever. I'd never heard of the Von Erich family um, or any of the other wrestlers that are in the movie, really. I'd heard of Ric Flair, but it begins and ends there. I know the name Ric Flair. I didn't know anything about him. Um, this was a heartbreaking fucking movie, and I thought that was a really interesting juxtaposition to have wrestling, which is like the most cartoonishly masculine thing you can do, where you've got these muscle-bound, oiled-up dudes in scantily clad, <laughs> beating the shit out of each other in the ring purely for entertainment purposes. Um, but the movie itself is very tender and very sensitive and very uh, emotional. And it interrogates, like, the Von Erich patriarch is this really stern, strict son of a bitch who, you know, won't let his sons show any emotion when they're at the funeral of a beloved family member. He's saying, I don't want to see any tears, even though everyone's broken inside about it, everyone's destroyed by this loss. And then you see the toll that takes of being in a family where you're not supposed to express your emotions, but there's a fucking lot to be sad about. And then you think, you know, this the dad who's really strict with them, he probably comes from an even stricter dad. You know, his parenting probably is lenient compared to what he grew up with. And it becomes this interesting, you know, perpetuating cycle of toxic masculinity. And uh, it just felt, I mean, all the actors are wonderful in it. You know, Jeremy Allen White is really great in it as uh, Kerry. And Maura Tierney, I think, was fantastic as the, as the mom. And 
Lily James was great as Zac Efron's love interest, but it really is Zac Efron's movie. He's really the, the star of it and this is sort of the uh, centerpiece. Because he's the, uh, he's not even really the oldest brother, he's the second oldest brother, but the oldest brother died really young. So he's taken on that responsibility of being the oldest brother, making sure everyone's taken care of, looking after everyone. And literally all this guy wants, he says at the beginning of the movie, all he wants is to spend time with his brothers. And he just loses them one by one. And it's devastating. Um, I mean, Zac Efron I already knew was a really strong actor and, and had been a big fan of his... Going back to High School Musical, I was a, I grew up, I was of the age that I was like a kid when High School Musical came out. And it was huge for my generation, we all loved it. Um, but this was one of those performances where you know an actor is really great, and then they show you these whole new sides of themselves, and this whole new depth you've never seen before. And that was what this was. And I can see what now, uh, why, you know, there was so much Oscar buzz around this movie. And and, and, I, and having now seen it, um, it seems insane that it didn't get any nominations. I think Zac Efron absolutely should have had a Best Actor nomination. Although it was a very competitive year. Because he was just uh, really fucking amazing and really touching in this role. And, uh, you know, it can't be easy to play emotion that is being held back to play a character who has so much so many feelings inside them that they because of how they were raised they won't allow themselves to let it out and he played it perfectly and it was beautiful and, and heart-wrenching i just thought it was an incredible fucking movie so moving and so uh, well made sean durkin i think is the director and he did such a fantastic job of taking this this really macho, masculine world of wrestling and making a movie about it that is really poignant and tender and touching. And the message ultimately, I mean, I'll, I'll, this is a spoiler because this is the final scene, so I won't, um, I'll put a spoiler tag on, but um, the final scene is fucking beautiful and I, I, it really kind of blew me away that Sean Durkin was able to take this movie that is so uh, grim and tragic and upsetting and so many awful, tragic things happen to the characters. And uh, Zac Efron's characters had to go through so much loss and grief and, and, and anguish and be able to end it on a somewhat optimistic note. Because he's out playing with his kids, because he's, you know, all his brothers are gone and he's out playing with his, his two sons and seeing them play together. And it's making him cry because he's seeing these two brothers loving each other and playing together and, and, and he's lost that. And, and the boys just come over and see him crying, give him a big hug. And tell him like it's all right and he's saying you know i'm a man i and i'm supposed to be a father figure role model i shouldn't be crying in front of you and his boys are both like it's fine cry away we cry all the time you should be able to cry and that's the message of the movie is that all these are not all of the horrible things can't be put down to the dad's strictness but that's certainly a factor and definitely a factor in how there ended up being two suicides in the family because uh that's what happens when you're not allowed to let out your emotions and you're forced to bottle them all up He's just telling his boys, you know, you two are brothers and love each other and I don't have that anymore and I used to. And they're just like, we'll be your brother's dead. It's just, uh, it was so beautiful. And it was, the whole movie was such a uh, emotional gut punch the whole time, like two hours. And then you just have those final two minutes that are suddenly uplifting. And uh, those are really incredible fucking movie. How to have sex. I, uh, I missed this movie when it was in cinemas. I really wanted to watch it, and then and then it came on Mubi, but I was having some technical issues with Mubi on my TV. Um, finally, I got to watch it a few days ago, and I thought it was incredible. It was um, it's a very uncomfortable watch because it deals with uh, with sexual assault and it deals with it in a really realistic way, um, which I think is much more powerful than the way it's usually played in movies, which is you know these really exaggerated, heightened situations, and they're horrific and horrible to watch. Um, but How to Have Sex deals more with the, the gray areas of consent um, in a really poignant way. And it's about, you know, like three 16-year-old three, um, British girls who've gone on holiday to... Uh, I can't remember where it is. One of those places like Malia or Magaluf. Or the typical British, you know, holiday destinations. Um, and they've just done their GCSEs. They're awaiting their results. And they've, and they've gone on holiday. And, and at first, they're having a great time. And... Um, and their friendships really ring true, and it's really, uh, feels really authentic to those kinds of, like, British teenager holidays. And then they meet these guys staying at the same sort of resort, and they, and they, and they get talking to them and start going out drinking with them, and, uh, at first everything seems to be going fine. And then about halfway through the film, um, there's, you know, a sexual assault, and, and you see the fallout of that, and how she deals with it, and how difficult it is to, uh, to talk about it um and then even when you do feel comfortable to talk about it to your friends to, to come up with the language to use and to uh you know and this movie i think is a huge turning point a huge stepping stone in in kind of providing that language um 
It was a really, really incredible film, really well made. It was the first film of, or first feature film directed by uh, Marley Manning Walker, who is another one I, got, I can't wait to see what she does next because uh, this was so powerful and so moving and so important. And the and the star of the movie, Mia Mia McKenna Bruce, uh, plays the lead role of Tara. She won the BAFTA um, like Rising Star Award, and uh, it's so deserving because this was such a, like a star making performance where you see um, so much depth and so much vulnerability, and it's such a great performance. It's just it's it's a it's a really really powerful film, and a, and uh, I think should be used as a touchstone in the, the discussion around consent because it seems to because it, it it puts into words and puts into perspective a lot of the a lot of the gray areas that people seem to be confused by. Good, thanks you. This was after I finished How to Have Sex on Movie. Movie recommended uh, Good, thanks you, which is. Um, which was a short that Molly Manning Walker directed before she made How to Have Sex. And um, it deals with a lot of the same themes. It deals with um, the difficulty of opening up about having been assaulted. And in the short, it's sort of left a bit ambiguous exactly what happened to this character. Um, but the, as she speaks to the authorities and tries to, you know, get it sorted out and get, and, and get justice, she's just completely disillusioned by their incompetence and all the red tape and all the bullshit. Um, so it's really interesting to watch as like a proof of concept for how to have sex because it deals with a lot of the same themes and it and it sh and it sort of shows how she would go on to deal with those themes on a bigger scale in a feature film and the nuance that she tells the story with um, and the realism the kind of brutal realism um, where it doesn't feel at all like you're watching a movie it feels like you are just sort of watching someone live their life um, at the toughest time in their life. I mean, she's such a great fucking director. I really, she's gonna have an incredible career. She's gonna make so many great movies. And uh, Good Thanks You and How to Have Sex are a great fucking start. Tony Erdman. This one had been on my my movie watch list for a long time. Um, Cause I remember it getting really well reviewed uh, when it came out about I don't know, seven, eight years ago. Brian made the connection that Sandra Huller uh, of Anatomy of a Fall and The Zone of Interest is the star of Tony Erdman. That was kind of like her breakthrough. It's easy to think of now as being a breakthrough because she's in two of the Best Picture nominees and got a Best Actress nomination. But she broke out and got international recognition years ago with Tony Erdman, which I was a bit dubious going in because it's a two and a half hour comedy, which is um, dangerous. But uh, it kind of earned every second of its runtime, and it's it's as much of a touching drama as it is an absurdist comedy. And it works beautifully on both those levels. It's a story of like she's this sort of like high flying businesswoman, and um, she's kind of estranged from her dad, who's a bit of a weirdo and likes to play practical jokes. Um, and then when the dad's dog dies, and he re and he sort of puts mortality in pers into perspective, he decides he wants to reconnect with his daughter. So he he just sort of like shows up. She's having drinks with her friends, and he shows up with like a ridiculous wig and fake teeth in, and presents himself as this character, Tony Erdman, um, which kind of reminded me of the the Andy Kaufman, Tony Clifton persona. And um, all of her friends are kind of charmed by Tony, this character. And then she, Sandra Huller never lets on. That's my dad in disguise. And um, he just starts like crashing her social events and crashing her work events. And at first she's kind of furious. She's like, can you just fuck off please and stop playing this ridiculous character in my life? Um, but then as the film goes on, she starts to realize my dad's a total weirdo and this is his way of reaching out to me and his way of trying to connect with me. Um, and she eventually lets, sort of lets her guard down and lets his love in. And I thought it was uh, fantastic. I absolutely loved it. It was an amazing movie. And I can't believe I didn't watch it sooner. I've let it sit there on my watch list for like a year. And this absolutely incredible, moving, hilarious movie was just sitting there the whole time. It was just great. If you've seen Zone of Interest and or Anatomy of the Fall and you think Sandra Hull is great, which she is, uh, and you want to see more of her stuff, and you haven't seen Tony Erdman, I highly recommend go back and watch Tony Erdman. Nathan for you, Finding Francis. I watched Finding Francis again because I was, I was, uh, I'd made my notes watching it the first time, and I was, and I was writing up my, 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 my script for what it's going to be the video, and um, so it was on my mind. And then um, my friend Mike was over. We wanted to watch a movie. We had about enough time for an hour and a half movie, and um, Finding Francis was just still on my mind. And uh, you know, he's seen some Nathan for you bits and found them really funny. So he's kind of told him the premise of it that Nathan's trying to reunite this old man with his long lost love. And so we watched it. And even though I'd just watched it a few days earlier, I got swept up in the journey again and and uh i just find bill heath this character so captivating I mean, he's not a, he's a real guy but i mean he's a, i mean in the way you call real people oh he's a character he's a character he's eccentric and strange 
um, but also very human and allows himself to be very vulnerable as this documentary goes on. Um, it's just, the whole thing's beautiful. It's like as awkward and weird as a, Nate, as a regular Nathan Few episode, but also this really touching love story. Lady Macbeth. This came on Netflix. This was sort of like, I think, Florence Pugh's breakout role. It may have even been her first role in a movie ever. And she's incredible. It's sort of set in the past, vaguely in the past. I don't really, it's mostly set in this one house, so I don't know really what time period it is. Let's say it's, I don't know, a hundred years ago. Um, and Florence Pugh is this young woman who's married to this much older man. Um, and it's at a time when if she has a thought or an opinion, he gets really angry and tells her not to. Um, and then while her husband's away, she starts having an affair with one of the servants um, who actually does let her have thoughts and opinions, which she appreciates. And then as it, you know, people start finding out about the affair um, and they sort of start to like threaten her with certain things and blackmail her. She kind of just starts picking people off. She kind of starts killing people. Um, and so that's where the Lady Macbeth of it all comes from. She's not actually, the character isn't Lady Macbeth. It's nothing to do with Macbeth, but she is that kind of Machiavellian mastermind. And um, I have to say, I mean, this probably isn't the response I was supposed to have, but I'm watching it and watching her get away with murder and the way she twists it around and puts the blame on other people and thinks on her feet and, and, and talks her way out of all these situations, even when she's caught red-handed. And I'm watching it going like, she's kind of fucking brilliant. She's kind of a genius. Which probably isn't supposed to be, I'm supposed to probably think she's a reprehensible monster because she's killing people. Um, but I don't know, I was watching it and I was like, she's fucking brilliant. <laughs> Um, but it was a great film and a great kind of exploration of, you know, when you, when you take away someone's voice and, uh, agency, um, you can only push them so far and they're gonna reach a breaking point. And it was, you know, Florence Pugh came right out of the gate. If that's her first performance ever, then she is truly one of the greatest actors who ever lived. Because that's, if that's what she came out of the gate with, she's just a mind-blowing talent, an incredible actor. Private Life. This is a really touching little kind of character-driven movie where um, Paul Giamatti and Catherine Hahn are this couple who are trying to conceive and it's... The first half of the movie is just showing how fucking difficult that is when you've got... There's problems with your eggs or problems with your sperm and you can do all these different things. You can try IVF, you can try um, egg donors or you can try and adopt from a, a pregnant woman but there's so many different ways they can all go wrong and blow up in your face and, and throughout this first hour of the movie that's exactly what it does. Everything that goes wrong. You know, they get... They meet this one woman who is pregnant and who has been sending them sonograms of her baby and They've been saying, she's been saying that they can have the kid and raise it. And then when they drive out to meet her at a restaurant, she just doesn't show up. And they turn out to have been, it turns out to have been like, it was like a fishing thing, but not for money. It was just like for the fun of the con, which is so fucked up. But I guess it's a thing that really happens. And then about halfway through the movie, they have the idea to ask their niece to be their egg donor. Um, and her parents played by uh, John Carroll Lynch and Molly Shannon, who are also fantastic, um, object to the idea because... You know, she's a kid, but she wants to do it and she wants to, um, so they kind of just embark on that journey together and she, and the niece moves in with them. The niece was, she was a great at performance as well. Let, let me just look up her name. Um, Kaylee Carter. She was really phenomenal and it was such a great performance of, you know, um, that she wants to do this amazing thing for her auntie and uncle, but isn't quite prepared for the, uh, the emotional and physical toll it's going to take to be in the doctor's office and be on all these drugs and, um, it just becomes this really interesting three-hander between this couple who are desperate to have a family and and then they kind of become parental figures to their niece while she's staying with them and that gives them sort of a taste of what it's going to be like to have a kid. And then you see how, you know, the really long process of trying to have a baby, um, the strain that that has on their marriage because they're just constantly focused on these medical things. He's injecting her with hormones and all kinds of stuff and the relationship kind of becomes more clinical than romantic. Um, I thought it was really uh, amazingly done. Nyad. I think Benning has been uh, nominated for Best Actress for it, and um, um, she plays Diana Nyad, the first person who swam, whoever swam from Cuba to Florida, which is an incredibly dangerous journey. And um, she set out to do it at like the age of 60. Um, or I think she'd previously tried in the 70s and then and then gave it another shot when, in her 60s and just kept trying until she got it. Um, and I kind of put off watching it because it's, you know, you know it's going to be great. It's going to be a great performance because... Uh, 
I mean, Annette Benning is great anyway, but man, she's been Oscar nominated. But I was kind of putting it off because I was like, I don't know, two hours of an old lady swimming. Is that really going to be that exciting? But um, I couldn't have been more wrong. It's amazing. It's a fucking amazing movie. And because uh, it's just, it's even interesting to get into the nitty gritty of how she does it. She needs to have Reese Ifans plays her navigator and he's on a boat alongside her the whole way. Because he's got to make sure that the, the, the current, that she is still going in a straight line. The current is going to, because you see even, they show like a diagram of all the routes she took. And they're going all over the place. They're curving everywhere because the, the chop is just pushing her and pushing her. It doesn't want her to go in a straight line, even though it is just a straight line. So she needs the navigator there, and she's got people who attach, attach like electrode things to her that emit these radio signals that make sharks turn away. So when a shark swims up to her and tries to take a bite out of her, and then, uh, you know, at one point the thing breaks and the guy has to jump in the water and fix it as the shark is approaching. And she keeps getting stung by jellyfish, um, which, you know, apart from being really painful, in some cases with like a box jellyfish, that could be deadly. And it was just so inspiring to see, you know, she eventually gets to about her fifth or sixth try at it, it's just amazing to see someone who refuses to give up. And uh, people keep trying to tell her, you're too old to do this. And she refuses to hear that. She's like, fuck you, you're not too old to do what you want to do. That's basically the message of the movie, you know? Um, is that if you want to do this amazing, crazy, record-breaking thing, and people tell you you're too old, fuck them, you can do it. And it's just an amazing feat. And uh, I think that burning was fantastic, but uh, the person who really shined for me was Jodie Foster, as her, her kind of like best friend slash trainer, or slash coach, um, who's in the boat with Reese and is following her the whole way, and sort of like cheering her on. Because that was, their chemistry is really beautiful, you really buy that they have a lifelong friendship. And they might do, I don't know, maybe Annette Benning and Jodie Foster are all longtime friends, but it's certainly seemed that way from how they, how close they seem in the movie. And, uh, you know, Jodie Foster is basically, play, it's basically, as much as the movie is about, you're not too old to achieve your dreams, it's also about the power of friendship. And the Jodie Foster character is that friend who will do fucking anything for you no matter what. And um, that's just beautiful to see. It was an awesome fucking movie. I was in tears at the end of it. And I was so, so glad that she made it to Florida. And from going from the beginning of like, all right, let's watch her swim, whatever, to being like, come on, Diana, you can make it. It's amazing. I can't praise it highly enough. Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. This one it came out a few years ago now, I think. And it was at the time, it was huge. It was like 100% Rotten Tomatoes. Was, I think I had an Oscar nomination for Best Animated Feature, even though because there's animation on screen, it counts as animated, but it's mostly live action. And it's kind of a mockumentary about this guy who goes to an Airbnb property and finds a talking little shell who uh, lives with his grandma. And he, uh, you know, there was a whole shell family, a whole shell community at this house that all mysteriously disappeared one day. And Marcel's trying to find his family. And it it's just fucking adorable. It's um, kind of remind me of Pixar, where it's like really cute and then also turns out to be really emotional and really heartbreaking and then heartwarming. Um, it was just such a beautiful character, um, played by Jenny Slate, although I would not have known it was Jenny Slate if it didn't say so in the credits, because it's she completely transforms her voice for this role. And plays Marcel as basically this like naive little kid who, um, you know, like a, like a kid has no filter and will just say anything. Um, and it's hilarious, and then, but also you start to really feel for Marcel, because he's just such a sweet, innocent little guy, and all he, want, he wants to be reunited with his family. It was just amazing. It hasn't been overpraised. It deserves all the praise it's had. And it's uh, just really touching, really funny, but also really sad at times and an and ultimately uplifting movie. It's, I think you would be hard pressed to find anyone, even the, the coldest, most stone hearted person will warm up and fall in love with Marcel. You know, I don't think anyone in the world could not be moved by Marcel's story. Loudermilk. Last but not least, I've started rewatching Loudermilk because, um, when I was watching it the first time, I recommended it to my dad, and then he started watching it, and then um, and then we were talking about it, and that reminded me how great it was, so I've started a second watch. And um, it's just great the second time. In fact, it rewards a second viewing, because you pick up on jokes you missed the first time, or um, there's certain little things that, that foreshadow twists that are coming later on, that the first time you watch it, you've no idea what's going on, what that, you know, you don't pick up on it. But knowing what happens, you do pick up on it, and it kind of adds that extra layer. Um, you know, it's just, a, it's such a funny show, and, and, and it's the character of Sam Loud, Milk is such a great, you know, like a Larry David-esque figure who just goes around complaining about things. But the fact that he's having to stay sober and he's kind of 
fed up with sobriety gives him a reason. He's not just going around being a dick to everyone. It's because he has to stay sober is why he's so cynical. And and the fact that he's leading this group, uh, a recovery group, gives him that likable quality. He's doing so very reluctantly, but ultimately he'll do anything he needs to do to help these people recover and to help these people stay sober. Um, and that's really beautiful and really and really touching and kind of kind of puts into perspective of just how hard it is to stay sober and how addiction kind of really is a disease. And uh, you know, it doesn't matter how long you've been sober, you're only 10 seconds away from a relapse, and you have to. It's a, it's a constant ongoing battle. So I really hope. I mean, it's been doing incredibly well in the Netflix streaming charts. So hopefully that leads to a season four renewal. My fingers are crossed. So there we have everything I watched in February. It was a great fucking month. I don't think there was a couple of bad movies, but mostly it was great shit. Um, I think Uma or Uma was the only one that was really bad. And then everything else I watched this month was at least really good, if not fucking great or transcendent. So hopefully that continues through March, although I think I'm due for some stinkers. Um, but if anyone has any recommendations of some great things you've been watching this month, let me know in the comments. Even though no one ever does, I'm going to say it anyway. Let me know in the comments if you have a recommendation. Um, hope everyone has a great March, and I will speak to you at the end of it. You just earned yourself a detention, sir. Being here with you is already one big detention. Son of a bitch, that's another detention! Thanks for watching guys, I hope you liked the video, remember to like and subscribe and click on the little bell, and also seize the day and call your mom and be kind to yourself.